Allison Cassidy is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Policy at the US EPA. She most recently served as the Deputy Staff Director for the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, where she managed a team of lawyers and scientists to conceptualize, draft, and deliver a congressional policy roadmap for achieving net zero emissions by 2050 and building a clean energy economy that values workers and advances environmental justice. You can find more of her bio in the program guide. Take it away, Allison. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Thumbs up if you can. All good. Um, all right, so thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference. I really appreciate it. Hopefully my dog won't be too much of a pest. Um, he is, he's poking at me right now. Um, my name is Allison and I am the Deputy Chief of Staff at EPA. Um, I've been at EPA for just four months, but in that short time, I have learned pretty quickly that EPA has thousands of really talented civil servants who are truly dedicated to the agency's mission of protecting human health and the environment. Uh, after all, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the land where our communities are built, these are EPA's bread and butter issues. And the connection between the health of our environment and the health of our communities is inextricable, as you all know. And there's perhaps no issue that better underscores that reality than climate change. And uh, like Mona said, you know, climate change is it's more than an environmental issue. It's a public health issue. It's an economic issue. It's a justice and civil rights issue. And moreover, climate change is here. And frankly, we're not ready. The COVID-19 pandemic laid bare the fractures in our nation's disaster preparedness at the federal, state, and local levels. And it also revealed fractures in our country's social cohesion and our ability to come together as individuals to solve a collective problem. Like the pandemic, climate change will leave no corner of our lives or economy untouched. And we can't solve it one person at a time or even one country at a time. And what we can't ignore is what Americans across the country are already seeing and feeling, which are the telltale signs of climate change. In 2020, for example, wildfires tore through more than 5 million acres across the American West, an area the size of New Jersey. And today the US drought monitor places about 60% of the Western states under severe, extreme or exceptional drought, setting the stage for yet another dis uh, dangerous and disastrous fire season. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has identified three ways by which climate change affects health, which I'm sure you all are aware of, but I'll, I'll, I'll say them just in case. Um, one are like the direct impacts, which relate primarily to the changes in the frequency of extreme weather, weather including heat, drought, and heavy rain. There are the effects mediated through natural systems, for example, disease vectors, waterborne diseases, and air pollution. And then there are the effects heavily mediated by human systems. So for example, occupational impacts, under, undernutrition, and mental stress. And children and the elderly are the most vulnerable to these impacts. Children are vulnerable at all stages of their development, prenatal through adolescence. At the same time, we know that the impacts of climate change fall hardest on our Black, Latino, Indigenous, and low-income communities and the children who live in them. These communities often have the fewest resources to prepare for and re rebound from a disaster. That's why you'll hear me talk about environmental justice quite a bit this evening. In national security circles, experts call climate change a threat multiplier. And the same is true for pre-existing social inequities. Climate change only makes them worse. Heat, for example, exacerbates underlying health conditions faced disproportionately by low-income people of color, many of whom reside in homes without air condition or in urban areas without tree cover. And COVID-19 has showed us what happens when an acute crisis lands on top of numerous chronic slow burning crises. COVID ignited the perfect storm spreading through the same communities who are most likely to live near polluting facilities and highways, those who suffer higher rates of heart and lung disease, and whose children face higher exposure to mold and air pollutants that trigger asthma. So on day one, President Biden issued an, an executive order that said, quote, even as our nation emerges from profound public health and economic crises born of a pandemic, 
We face a climate crisis that threatens our people and communities, public health and the economy, and starkly our ability to live on planet Earth. In an early executive order, President Biden committed to implement a whole of government approach that reduces climate pollution in every sector of the economy, from every part of the, go the government, and increases resilience to the impacts of climate change. But as we move forward to build a cleaner energy economy to tackle climate change, we can't pat ourselves on the back for progress if we aren't at the same time securing justice for the communities that have borne the brunt of our fossil fuel-based economy for decades. In, in direct response, the president has directed agencies to make achieving environmental justice part of their missions by developing programs, policies, and activities to address the disproportionately high, adverse, and cumulative health and environmental impacts in disadvantaged communities. Now, this is really hard work, and we're trying to turn the Titanic called the federal government in the United States of America, and it won't happen overnight, and it will take a village, as they say, but we need to get to work as fast as possible on key solutions. And the ICC's, uh, IPCC's report on the health impacts of climate change, it said that the most effective measures to reduce vulnerability to the health impacts are programs that implement and improve basic public health measures, such as provision of clean water, securing essential health care, such as vaccinations and child health services, increasing the capacity for disaster preparedness and response, and alleviating poverty. So with that in mind, first and foremost, our country needs to invest in infrastructure. The communities most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change are those who are not only marginalized and overburdened by pollution, but those that have received less investment in housing, transportation, water infrastructure, and healthcare. The president announced his American Jobs Plan to reimagine and rebuild a new economy, one that is more resilient to climate change and more equitable. The president's American Jobs Plan includes more than $100 billion to start to tackle America's water infrastructure problems. It proposes $45 billion to replace 100% of lead pipes, and $56 billion in grants and low-cost loans to upgrade America's drinking water, wastewater, storm, and stormwater systems, and to make them resilient to climate change. Water infrastructure is the perfect example of the inextricable link between climate change, public health, and environmental justice. As one case study, in case in point, uh, for decades, residents of Centerville, a nearly all-Black town of 5,000 in Southern Illinois, have been dealing with the health impacts of their crumbling water infrastructure. A, water, a rainy day can trigger persistent flooding and sewage overflows, leaving residents to rely on bottled water and worry about the long-term health impacts of living in these unsanitary conditions. Towns like Centerville are on the front lines of climate change because the crumbling infrastructure unable to deliver safe water today will be no match for the climate impacts of tomorrow. So infrastructure is a crucial building block for a cleaner, more resilient economy, but we also need to set strong health protective standards for air and water pollution and drastically cut the pollution that causes climate change. And EPA is at the center of that agenda. We recently took a major step toward restoring California's authority to enforce stringent greenhouse gas pollution standards for vehicles. And we'll be announcing new standards for light duty vehicles nationally in July. We also recently proposed new rules to phase down HFCs, which are highly potent greenhouse gases used in refrigeration. We're also taking a fresh look at our options for setting greenhouse gas emissions limits from both new and existing power plants. And we'll propose standards to reduce, met reduce methane emissions from new and existing oil and gas sources by September. Last week, we announced a broad public outreach effort to gather community and stakeholder input into this effort. And as we develop these rules, environmental justice will be at the heart of our work because it's our obligation to empower the people who've been left out of the conversation for too long. In the words of EPA Administrator Regan, environmental justice will be part of our DNA at EPA. On April 7th, which was only a month and a half ago, but seems a lot longer ago, <laughs> Administrator Regan directed EPA staff to incorporate environmental justice into every aspect of their work, including rulemaking, permitting, and enforcement of cornerstone environmental statutes and civil rights laws in communities overburdened by pollution. And consistent with President Biden's Justice 40 initiative, which aims to deliver 40% of the benefits of climate investments to underserved communities, 
EPA will prioritize direct and indirect benefits to these communities in our grants and loans. To close, I'll simply say, you know, we have an obligation to correct decades of environmental injustice while we build a brighter, healthier, more equitable future where all people can thrive in a safe climate. 